that's all. All right, we're gonna start with a song. A song in our hearts. Okay. I'm gonna share the computer sound and uh, I'm gonna mute everybody. So if you need to speak, unmute yourself. <clears throat> and myself. And I am so excited. We have our Reverend Faith with us today. Yay! <laughs> and I think, I'm not sure if you remember everybody, but you got everybody's names there. Oh, and Bob. I don't know if you know Bob. Bob, this is Reverend Faith. Reverend Faith has been a very big supporter when Carolyn had the group before. Yes, I know. I know almost everyone. Yeah. I'm not sure I know Janet or Nita as well. I guess they're both newer. No, but yes, it's that. good to be here. Good. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Faith is going to do a treatment, right, Faith? You're going to do a treatment first? You go, you take over, whatever you want to do is yours. <laughs> All right. So we just take a breath and recognize that as we breathe, there's an atmosphere that's surrounding us that 
creates that air coming in and out of our body temple. And that atmosphere that surrounds us surrounds everything and everyone and is actually in as and through each of these making us one. And so we can fully know that there is one mind and one presence and one power, one creator, one divine inspiration. And we breathe that in and connect to one another so that we understand that virtually, even we, though we are not located in the same space, we are still together right here and right now, fully present, whole, perfect, and complete at the core of our being. Because that seed that thought of us that brought us forth is whole, perfect, and complete. And we spring forth from that wholeness, that perfection, and that completeness. So I just give thanks here today at this point in time for this gathering, for understanding and awareness and friendship and camaraderie and music and prayers and everything that is entailed in this and more. I claim that it is good and very good. And so it is. So it is, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna do our identity prayer now. Everybody wants to say it with me. I know that oh, within myself, myself, there is a life which is perfect, complete, and divine. It was never born, and it cannot die, for it lives and is God. Within myself is wholeness, peace, poise, and the power of life. This life is health, it is abundance, it is love. There is one life, and it is the life of God. And this is my life now, and so it is. Okay, Faith, it's yours. So I'm just going to invite you to take a breath and um, close your eyes if you're comfortable doing that. And if not, just downcast them so that you are not distracted by outer things. And so we come together with that. Uh, breath, inhaling deeply and exhaling completely. And do this very consciously. And with the next breath, I'm going to invite you to inhale to the count of four through your nose and exhale to the count of eight out your mouth. This type of breathing into the count of four and out to the count of eight just creates a new energy in your body. So just do that for two more breaths. And then breathing normally, notice how your body is feeling, how you're sitting. How does your back feel? Notice which parts are touching the floor or, or the chair or the floor. And notice your shoulders, if your neck, if it's tight, allow it to relax and let them go. So just wiggle and stretch and relax any body area that is tense, relaxing ever more deeply with the breath. And I'd like you to imagine that you're in a beautiful park all of your senses are filled. There's fresh air, beautiful foliage and flowers. It's the perfect temperature. And you notice lush green grass beneath your bare feet. It is the perfect te temperature for bare feet and you are barefoot. You can feel that grass underneath your feet. And you notice now that there is a stream close by and it is really just a stream. It's not a raging river, but a stream. There's more of the park on the other side of the little stream and it's very peaceful. 
So walk to the edge of the stream. And there's a, a sandbar. There's a sandbar that kind of juts out into the stream, keeping the water at a low level. So just walk out onto the sand and feel your feet in the cool water. And just notice how good the coolness feels as the water passes over your feet. And you find yourself just watching the stream go by and notice that it's like the flow of life itself. The things happen, the water goes around, little stones are over them, things change, and the water keeps moving. And we begin to notice that flow of life. We, we worry and things happen and it changes. We're happy, we have a great time and it moves on and shifts. We clean the kitchen, we wash all the dishes and the kitchen gets dirty again. We clean the floors and the floors get dirty. We fill the car with gas. Before you know it, it's empty. We eat and we feel so good. And before long, we're hungry. The flow of life flows just like the river. It doesn't just stop. And even though sometimes we want to freeze it, it doesn't, it flows. And the more we can accept the fact that it flows, the better our lives become and the better our lives will flow. Now, looking over on the other side of the stream, you notice there's people over there too, lots of people on, on their grassy slope. For some reason, they don't look as happy as you feel right now. They're not as happy with some of the changes in the world and things that have happened or, or perhaps you're unhappy and they are happy, but they're too, they're also looking at the stream and seeing it just flow. <clears throat> As you gaze at this group of people, notice anywhere in your body where you feel any judgment, fear, hate, concern. And breathing deeply and inhaling through your nose and exhaling through your mouth, shift any of those feelings to something more gentle. Because knowing that it is just a stream that seems to separate us, and in fact, you could even walk across it. It's not a deep river, you can walk across. And knowing that, you might want to walk across the stream and say hello to someone. It could be someone you know, a friend, a relative, a total stranger. This person could be living in the body form or perhaps another dimension here and showing up for you. And perhaps if you're not walking across the stream, someone comes over to talk to you. So just notice again, if you're imagining fear or anger or harm and begin to shift it to disappointment, perhaps some sadness and maybe fear so that it can again transform into something even lighter. And then, however it is for you, you're standing on your side of the stream now. If a visit has taken place, you remember it. And you notice your feet in the cool water again and see the flow of the stream and you're feeling safe with whatever feelings you're having. And you notice the people on the other side of the stream are feeling safe with the feelings they are having. And that's the flow of life that's going to go on, regardless of things that happen in this world, 
of elections and politics and pandemics and people who have different views than you. Whether you see them as scary or threatening. Our goal here is to understand that our feet in the cool water allows us to see something in a different way. To get out of our habitual thoughts. So I invite you to come back out of the park now into this space, into the chair you're sitting in, into the space. You can wiggle your toes, hands, move your shoulders, open your eyes, and just be back here in the world where things are happening. And so obviously that's a little meditation about what's happening in our world. And I'd like you to remember how many felt cool water? How many felt the cool water? So the cool water, what happens is our head goes round and round and round with thoughts. And by putting our attention on our feet, tapping them on the floor, imagining them cool. We get out of our head and we can slow those thoughts down. And so this is a technique that you may use anytime. Thank you for joining me with that. We'll have a little chant now. <clears throat> We let the love wash over us. We let, we let it be. I invite you all to sing with me. We let the love wash over us. We let, we let it be. <clears throat> we let the love wash over us. We let, we let it be. <clears throat> We let the peace wash over us. We let, we let it be. We let the peace wash over us. We let, we let it be. One more time. We let the peace wash over us. We let, we let it be. So, welcome everyone. It's so nice to be here with you today. So, the title of my talk is How Are You Thinking Today? We're also going to be talking about how you're seeing today and how you're feeling today. And what is today going, what is today really talking about for you? Um, so, if you really know me, and some of you do know me better than others, but if you really knew me, you would know that you would know that as a teenager, I made a decision and my father supported me by not telling me anything to do or not to do. He supported me by being silent. And that was a gift. Um, I'm going to ask Paul if we can stop the screen sharing so we can see each other more. How's that sound? Um, because I like to see your faces. And if you really knew me also, one of my most favorite 
Ernest Holmes' statements is there is a power for good in the universe that is greater than you are, and you can use it. I don't know about you, but when I say that out loud, and even when I read it, if I'm just reading it and contemplating it, so, so just for a moment, downcast your eyes and listen to this again. There is a power for good in the universe greater than you are, and you can use it. Does that not resonate in your whole body and create all of the cells begin to acti be activated? For me, it does. There is a power for good in the universe greater than you are, and you can use it. So in a nutshell, this means that we are connected to the power of God and that God is available to us. Um, we've heard that ever since we started this program today. That's what we've been talking about. And through our acknowledgement, through our belief, through our faith, through our trust, God is responsive to our needs and to our desires. So we can use this power and, and we are influential in how that comes about to us because we are at choice also. We are co-creators with God. So here's what I believe. When you were born, the stars in the sky twinkled and shined their light. And, and the wind sang its song through the leaves and the trees and the water went over the stones and babbled in the brook. Um, hearts were touched. Every heart was touched when you were born because you make a difference in the world. So all of celebration, all of the celebration, all of creation was celebrating you. Sometimes as we get older, we forget. We forget how curious we were as children. And we don't have time to be curious about everything and explore now because we actually know it, right? We actually know what it is. So, so we don't have time to be in awe at every leaf on every tree or the little bug that's crawling on the concrete. You know, how the little kid will just look at that and watch its movement and how it goes and be amazed. And we don't have time for that anymore. But children, I'm going to ask you to begin being more childlike. And they're always asking questions. And anyone who's been a parent, an aunt, an uncle, a teacher, or just an observer of children has probably gone through the stage of questions. Why? Well, why? How? I don't understand. How? Why? When? And eventually, as parents, we usually get a little frustrated and go, quit asking questions. Go read a book. Go do something. And yet, it is those, are those questions and those ideas and that ability to learn and want to learn, the desire, is what is really needed in our lives ever, all the time. You know, we call practices practices for a reason because we need to practice them. Even the greatest mystics in the world never stopped praying. They never stopped questioning. They never stopped looking for more because there's always more. So to be as little children and wonder and delight in learning and be willing to find out, to be curious, is really what, what I think we're all about. And as adults, we do that together. So I'm going to tell you a little story that most of you have heard before, but I want you to listen with fresh ears and I want you to hear this at a new level today, if you're willing, and, and if it speaks to you. This is a parable from ancient India. And it's the parable of the blind men and the elephant. So there's a group of blind men who heard that a strange animal called an elephant was coming to town. But none of them knew the shape or form of this strange animal. 
So out of curiosity, they said, we must go explore. And even though we don't have that gift of sight, we have touch. And we can each touch and talk to each other and find out what it is. And so they went into town and they sought out the elephant. And the first person's hand on the elephant found the trunk. And he said, ah, this is like a thick snake. For another one whose hand touched the ear, he said, it feels soft like a fan and, and thin. And for another whose hand uh, was on its leg, the elephant was like a pillar, a tree trunk. And the blind man whose hand found the wall or the side of the elephant said, oh, it's like a wall, it's big and strong. And of course, the one with the tail said, well, the elephant is much like a rope. The last one felt its tusk and stated that the elephant is that which is hard, smooth, and like a spear. Now, in some versions of this, the blind men then discover their disagreements, that everyone is different, and they suspect the others of not telling the truth. And they actually come to blows and start fighting physically. In some versions, they stop talking and start listening and comparing. And they begin to see the fullness of the elephant. In another version, a sighted man comes along and begins describing to them that, uh, from various perspectives. And the blind man learned that they were all partially correct and partially wrong. So while one's subjective experience is true, it not, may not be the totality of truth. So my experience that I have is definitely true for me, but it may not be the whole truth. So the humans have a tendency to claim absolute truth, don't we? I know this is true. I know it and I claim it. And yet, when we do that, we're ignoring someone else's subjective truth and their idea of what, can, what life can be. Because their ideas and their, their experiences are equally true. So when we have one piece of the puzzle and become curious and we're, we want to work together, we can begin to understand more. We've known that for a very long time, but we forget it. So I'm not really here today to tell you anything new that you haven't heard, but maybe you can hear it in a new way that will awaken something for you moving forward in your life in a new way. When we are willing to be like a child and see again with that curiosity, have any of you had the experience of a fairly newborn baby, oh, probably months, several month old, when they begin to see their hand for the first time, there's this object floating out there. Oh, and it is, it's, it's miraculous and it kind of moves and it has, Oh, look at that. The baby is mesmerized. And it's a time before that baby realizes, man, it's connected. This hand is connected to my body. And we, we look at God that way sometimes, don't we? God is out there. Oh, man, look at all the wonders that God does. And yet, we forget that God is right here working through us, and we are a wonder also. We have things in us that, that we don't allow out because we can't even see them yet. So there's a constant way to explore who we are and how we do life in this world. And becoming more childlike is one way to do that. So we have come to pivotal points in our world today where things are inviting us to look with new eyes, fresh eyes, 
to think in new ways, to see in new ways, to hear in new ways, to listen so that we can learn, to become curious. It is time what I have learned because I have become um, very, very interested in this idea of racism in our country and how we deal with that. And the more I uncover things and understand it, the more I realize how I have not been thinking in a way that others have known to think. I have not been seeing things the same way either. And I am now hearing things in different ways. In fact, to tell you the truth, at our Thanksgiving dinner table, we had one couple over who are neighbors and we know they're being very uh, cautious in their life and someone said something about Black Lives Matter. And then the statement came out, all lives matter. And I just went, because that's a, a bypass in a way for me, what from what I've learned. And I was, so I stepped right in that, right in that pool. And I was like a dog with a bone and wouldn't let it go. And finally they let it go because I wasn't. So it's amazing to me what we can learn at whatever age we are and whatever we are doing. But part of our points here are that we cannot continue to label in broad brushstrokes groups of people. It's become clear that Republicans and Democrats are not great labels anymore, are they? We separate ourselves from that. Large groups, those people, people of color, people with different sexual orientation, when we put a broad brushstroke across those, we also begin to lose part of our own identity. So we need to do no harm. And whenever we belittle or talk down or think we are better, or more righteous or whatever, something is happening in our own body system to our individual identity. So I'm, I'm gonna invite you just to consider when you are speaking, if you are talking about them, that it, it might not be the best thing to do because they are a lot like you. They want the same things in life that you do. When it comes down to the bare basics, that's what they want. So what are you thinking about them? Or what are you thinking about yourself? You know, if our thoughts are creative, then um, we have to really believe that. So our bodies are truly miraculous things. And the more I learn about the body, uh, the more interesting I find things happening too, but I'm, I'm just amazed to learn that the brain is not the first organ that recognizes things, that our heart is the first organ that recognizes things and then sends a message to the brain. And I don't know if you've heard that before, but there's a lot of, of research on heart math and different things to find out that the heart is actually the first point where we feel, know something. And then our brain says, oh, we need to be afraid or we're fine. We need to do this or that. Um, and our heart is actually where compassion begins. So it's interesting to me how we can even talk about them or they if our heart is so compassionate. But for some reason, there's a, such a quick movement to the brain that our brain begins to take over our thinking. Um, Brian Stevenson, who wrote Just Mercy, which is a story of justice and redemption, has two quotes that I have really enjoyed through the years and they came up as I was looking at this topic. He says that our, we're connected by our brokenness. We are all broken by something. Something has happened in our life and we've all hurt someone and we have been hurt. We all share a condition of brokenness, even if our brokenness is not equivalent. 
So yes, yours may have been more devastating or, than mine, but we all have something that is broken. He says there is a strength, a power even in understanding this brokenness because embracing it creates a need and a desire for mercy, compassion, and perhaps a corresponding need to show mercy or compassion. When you experience mercy, you learn things that are hard to learn otherwise, and you see things that you can't otherwise see. You hear things you can't otherwise hear, and you begin to recognize the humanity that resides in each of us. So it is our shared pain, our brokenness, that connects us. I think there are other ways. I think happiness can connect us too but I'm just giving you his quote here. The other thing he says, which I think is most important, I've come to understand and believe that each of us is more than the worst thing we've ever done. I'm going to say that one again. I've come to understand and to believe that each of us is more than the worst thing we have ever done. I believe that for every person on the planet, I think if someone tells a lie, they're not just a liar. I think if someone takes something that doesn't belong to them, they're not just a thief. I think even if you kill someone, you're not just a killer. And because of that, there's a basic human dignity that must be respected. So we have come here to be caretakers of each other, caretakers of ourselves. And what we think makes a real difference, whether we are willing to step back and say, oh, you, your idea may be as valid as mine. I may not agree with it. I may not understand it. I may not choose that path. But your idea, if it's right for you, has to have merit in some way, shape, or form. And we've all heard before in this teaching, or, or maybe not, um, that God doesn't create junk, right? We're not, none of us are junk. None of us are, are um, better or worse than one another. We're just different. We're diff showing up differently. And how good that is. Because if I want to talk to Carolyn, because she knows how to do jewelry, you know, that's, if I know that she makes jewelry, I would go to Carolyn and say, hey, can you help me? Because I want to learn this. If I want to learn something about computers, I would go to Tom or Paul. And so how boring would it be if we only had one person doing one thing, then that's all everyone did. You know, we would be missing out on a lot of, of good things. So when we, what are you thinking today? What are you feeling and what are you willing to say and be in this world of form? What are you want, willing to create with your life? And with that, I'm just going to invite us to go to prayer. Just for a moment to, to sit in this space that we have opened together, sit in this space where we have explored a little bit of what life is, to sit in this space of spirit itself that connects each one of us. I'm going to invite you in your mind's eye to reach your hands to the outer side, or you can even do it, reach your hands up and touch the edges of your square so that you're touching other people, because we miss that in this world. We just miss that. So you're touching the people who are next to you, giving them a virtual hug and sending your energy out. And even in this time of pandemic and, and social distancing, we can find ways to connect through our mind, through our eyes as we smile at the store above our mask and through our mask, we find ways to connect because we are one. 
And I just give thanks that that this knowing, this teaching called Science of Mind is here in Charlottesville and, and ready to be, to have its mark in the world, to take this teaching beyond whatever it is, this little group, to spread it out into the community simply by being who you are being in the world and people saying, I like that. Where can I get that? So our task today is to spread that, spread that love, spread that joy and have someone say, how do you do that? And you willingly say, come, come with me and I'll show you. So breathing in, I just say yes to spirit in action in all we do, in all we say, in all we think, in all ways. And so it is, amen. Thank you, Arabe. That's an important message as we go through this time of change. And you see everything changing around us. And I think we're more aware of each other. And we're more patient and understanding, I think. And I think we were so far apart with the elections and everything that um, there's such a need to get back together again. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know that about the heart as the first organ. That's interesting. We did that heart math with um, Joe Dispenser and Greg Braden, you know, mm -hmm. and it teaches you the strength of your heart. And when you meditate and you come from your heart, it's so much deeper when you're aware of that. Yeah. Shall we, <clears throat> shall we do our song, Kathy? Yeah. Okay.
as always, perfect, perfect song, Jane. Very good. Goes right with Reverend Faith's talk. Certainly. Reverend Faith, what? Uh, repeat, if you could, please, the thing about the heart being the first organ. I was, there, <laughs> I was like, huh? Wait a minute. There have been some studies that um, have shown that the heart goes, the heart receives the message before the brain, that it actually sends the message to the brain. But it's so fast that no one really recognizes that. Yeah. You know, let me, it, this came to me as you were saying that, and um, I'll state that I'm an empath, so I, I pick up on um, people's emotional characteristics, mm -hmm. and uh, I have what I call my sleaze meter, which is kind of like, you know, judging is this person being honest or, or dishonest, or are they being forthright, or are they holding things back? Uh, so I noticed that, but it occurred to me that the heart is the center of empathy and empathy is, uh, your, uh, spiritual connection. And I think the reason that, or a possibility is that we misunderstand, um, what's going on with other people. You know, we misjudge, we have prejudices and so forth because we're so immersed in our own energy that we're, you know, it's like you have your own energy is not letting the other, the energy of other people through so that you can get that heart judgment of who they really are and what's really going on with them. You, you know, I always want to um, remind people, too, that sometimes when we're talking on subjects like this, there's different levels. I mean, we live in a world where I'm not saying you, sh you should run up and hug and kiss everyone because, because they're God in action. Um, we have safety rules here. When I was 16, my dad sat me down and said, you know, Faith, there are rules in the physical world, like driving on the right side of the road and stopping at stop signs, and those things keep you safe. He says, and then there are spiritual rules and laws. So, so just so we're clear, I uh, would never say that you should put your physical body in harm's way, being nice, trying to be nice to everyone. Does that I don't know if you're doing that, but Paul, you have a judgment system that probably works for you and, and allows, it's trying to keep you safe, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. And, and so we don't want to deny that in any way. Um, and, and if we can let some of that guard down and let people feel feel them at the center of their being as much as they'll allow us to and have more, it promotes more understanding. In other words, we're not judging them by who they are, what their job is, what the color of their skin is or anything else. We're allowing us to know each other at a deeper level. I don't well, know if that's kind of where you're going or not. Yeah, well, part of what I was saying is to be uh, that it may be a good thing to recognize that um, uh, that you have your own energy and when you get so focused in on that energy you know so you're fo so focused in on your own grieving or your own anger or your own your own emotions your own emotions you know the stronger your emotions are the stronger that energy is and the more difficult it is for that signal, if you will, uh, from other uh, people to come through. Now, you know, the, the, um, uh, the, the sleaze meter is, as I call it, is I agree with you that that's kind of my um, uh, defense mechanism, if you will. It's my way of knowing, you know, hey, I need to, I need to be a little more guarded with this person 
uh, and uh, but it doesn't mean it doesn't mean that I can't still be open with them. It just means that I have to be uh, uh, I have to be more cognizant that that their uh, views and values may not be what's you know what's on the surface. I would suggest you might want to change the name. <laughs> change the name of sleaze meter instead, instead of sleaze meter. Yes, yes. Oh, I was hearing sleeve. I wasn't getting the sleeve. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he said there are some people he feels like he wants to put rubber gloves on before he gets around them. <laughs> Yeah. Talking about the heart, this is crazy, but my cat killed a bird this morning <laughs> as I went outside to pick up the paper. And he, they chop off, you know, they take the head off first. But what I noticed was <clears throat> he left the heart of the bird there and everything else was gone. But the little heart was right there with the head. Weird. I know it. I uh, and it just hit me when you were saying heart. You know, I thought, well, isn't that interesting that he would leave the heart of the bird and not eat it or do anything to it, or the meat, and nor the heart, nor the head, but everything else was eaten. And gone. Wow. I know it. <laughs> so what, that is strange. You know, huh? There's there's something else that uh, they discovered a few years ago. <clears throat> um, and that is um, uh, in chickens and in, in eggs um, that when a baby chicken is first forming in the egg, the very first thing that happens is that, um, you know, they put a tiny, tiny camera in there. And the very first thing that they saw was the fluid moving back and forth, back and forth in a rhythmic way and at the center of that moving out and out and out, <clears throat> the heart formed. <laughs> oh, interesting. And, um, and the rhythm was in tune with the heartbeat. And uh, I just find that that's just gives me chills when I think about that. And that's the first thing. That's the first thing they had was the the rhythm of the heartbeat and the heart formed at the center of that um, fluid going out and in, out and in. Hmm. So that's our earliest memory? <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Really? Remember that. that would be good. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was yeah. just thinking the same thing, Bob. I mean, maybe that's how the human developed yeah. also. Maybe. Well, pretty much all um, all animate creatures uh, form in about the same way. At least, um, um, you know, I don't know that I can say that for worms or butterflies, but certainly for um, for all mammals. And uh, you know, mammals essentially descend descended from the same stock that that uh, lizards did, which birds did so that you know if you if you look at the development from the very first zygote they develop in the same way hmm. you know you start off with the one cell and the cell divides into two cells and it forms this little sphere of of cells and you know it goes on from there so at a certain level of development from uh, conception from the uh, fertilization of the egg, from there until quite a long ways along, it's identical between uh, different creatures. Yeah. In, and, in your and, uh, in your book, uh, Just Mercy, was it Cameron who uh, wrote that? Um, I think he started a museum. Brian Brian Stevenson. Brian Stevenson. He's been on television a couple of times. He's a wonderful speaker. There's a movie. There's a movie, Just Mercy. Is it? Okay. Also, from the book. It's really, it's pretty good. Right. I, I saw him speak at the Paramount Theater. Very powerful. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. he, and, he and John Grisham had a dialogue. So it was uh, talking about, um, you know, justice. He came back and uh, he was a lawyer, came back and tried to help people that are on death row, I think. That was his main job, uh, mm -hmm. and he he saved a lot of people. Of course, he lost a lot too, and that's how he he wanted just mercy. You know, it was it it was very very good. Yeah, I think we all woke up uh, when we saw Floyd George uh, George Floyd die. Uh, I think that really made a big impression in the United States, and I know it did to me and a lot of people. Uh, what black people have gone through you know mm -hmm. and telling their children what to go you know what to be afraid of when they go out you know so i was uh it, it has uh, changed my view uh, completely on the systemic uh, racism in this country yeah some of the i mean i wasn't born around i didn't have a lot of connections with people of color but you know, I had friends, I have, and I have friends of color that I really like and enjoy, but I still never realized right. what that, what, how their lives were so different than mine. Yeah. And that's still had. so prevalent, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's better than it was in the 60s, but we still have a long ways to go. A long ways. Mm -hmm. Well, one of, the, one of the things is we seem to focus on what what divides us you know we seem to focus on uh, <clears throat> my son is less has less of that and i think the younger kids have less than that because they've had a more diverse <sighs> upbringing as far as race and everything else yeah. and my, my son ended up spending a a, a post-grad year at, at a school where they had asians and blacks and he, his roommate was a black football player but when you live when your humanity when you're in a situation where you're living side by side with somebody of color some or race that tends to disappear in the everyday humanity of what you're dealing with together you know mm -hmm. they were all in the same boat and it, it ends up that that they're all they're all brothers. They, they kind of, the, where they came from, what their race is, what their color is kind of, kind of fades to the background. And all those guys are, are still friends. My son, you know, has played sports all his life. And most of the time his, his teams were at least 50% black, if not more, you know? And so he's got a, a larger perspective certainly than I had growing up. Um, and he's, that's one of his things. He, he doesn't understand why people are racist or how they could be racist. Yeah. People don't, uh, people are not born racist. Yeah. Right, they're conditioned. They, yep. they learn yeah, that. They're taught, like the song in South Pacific. Mm -hmm. that, it's that? song in South Pacific. Talk. No. So I want to respond to Tom because um, I had a, a really interesting conversation with my son too because I figured his well he's he's married to a lady from the Philippines and so his children are biracial and I would they went to a, a school where there were all kinds of different ethnic groups and stuff too. So I thought he would know more about this than I did. But what I'm finding is even though I have had close friends that are people of color and all that, I still didn't understand the systemic racism in our country. So the idea that you can have close friends is good and a step forward, but I think understanding what's behind all this, why they have to have the talks with their children, why people stand by and watch someone being killed on the street um, is much deeper. And it takes us, a, it takes it for me, it takes a conscious delving into it. So yep. there's a, 
a group that meets on Wednesdays at 12. I don't know if you know Eugene Holden, who yeah. in the science of mind. So he and Reverend Lane Cobb um, have an hour on Wednesdays from 12 to one. Uh, they have it in series of eight and then they take a break for a week or two. And then they have a series, another series where it's just basically conversation. It's a mixed group, um, mostly white at the moment, but uh, one third, two thirds maybe. And it's, it's things like that and reading the books and, and getting involved in other groups, anything that you can to understand that this, we didn't create it. We didn't create it, but there's a responsibility we have for equality in this country. And that's what, where I kind of go. So well, yeah, I didn't create it, but somehow it's here and somehow we can change it. Right. Yeah, and the fact that you don't realize how it is, my son still, I don't think realizes how it is. And he lived together in a, in a military barrack style with his friend who was black, their their best friends, and two other people that they all lived together in a one room in a barracks for four years. And when all this happened with George Floyd, one of the other members wrote to Stan, who was black. And I mean, he's a very intelligent person. His mom and dad are PhD professors down in Carolina at uh, the Triangle, whatever it is. But at any rate, he he responded. One of the white roommates wrote and asked him, "Is this is this true? Did you have do you have to worry about this? Do you have to? I mean, they lived together for four years mm -hmm. and did not realize. And Stan wrote back and said, "I just take it for granted. That's why he never talked about it. He says I just take it for granted." Yeah, sad. You know, I've lived in big cities all my life. I've never lived in a small town like this, and certainly not in the boonies of Rutgersville. But <laughs> I've worked retail from the time I was 16 years old, and you learn that you watch people. And if a black woman walks into the clothing department, you watch what she does. So I've been aware of this for a very long time. I've had neighbors with black children who called the police every time they left the house to tell them where they were going and what car they were driving. So this, and a neighbor of mine just said, do you mean that really happens? And I said, yeah, it happens every day in this country. But if you don't see it and you're not aware of it, you don't know it, you don't believe it. No. Well, it's implicit bias or consciousness bias is what they call it. And you're, and you're, you're reacting unconsciously yourself. Yeah. You know? and, it, and, it, and it even happens interracially. Oh, yeah. We, I think it was Martin Luther King that said, I, I listened to a talk from um, the Associate Dean of Diversity at UVA, and he related a story about Martin Luther King walking down a dark street at night and hearing footsteps behind him. And Martin Luther King's statement about that was, it shook his soul that his first thought was, I hope it's not a black man. Oh. Really? Wow. Isn't that interesting? And you another another one with women is they did they did a medical um at Duke. They had a board that was hiring for a men uh, medical managerial position and took a male and a female and identical identical, identical credentials. And they hired the man credentials. And they rated the, the woman lower. Even right. women on that panel rated the woman. Yeah. Lower. yeah. We're our own worst enemy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, you don't even you don't even realize you're doing it. Yeah. I've heard of women that won't join women's groups because of that. They said that the, the other women in the group are all always, always so mean toward them, you know, toward trying antagonism and stuff, which is, I think is strange, but I've never seen that, but it's only it's only it's only becoming aware of it, becoming aware that this happens because there's a test online. <laughs> take this implied uh, 
bias test online. I think it's at Harvard or somewhere. As a matter of fact, the associate dean of diversity said his friend developed the test. And he said, well, I'm going to go take it. I'm not biased. There's nothing wrong with me. I'll pass this with flying colors. And he took it. And it he was biased. And he goes, oh, something was wrong with the test. Check the wrong box. Or something. I'll just take it again. And he took it again, showed he was biased. Called his friend up that developed the test and says, something's wrong with your test. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I have a question um, because I haven't heard some of the voices in the room yet. Can, can we hear, can we kind of go around and, and see where everyone's at and if they want to say anything or a prayer request or anything like that? Well, they usually mute me because my, for something in my television that makes a, makes a lot of noise or something. <laughs> well, you're not muted so I'm now. usually muted. Betty, uh, you're actually being pretty quiet today. I mean, you, you may really not need to do that anymore. Well, well, maybe they got rid of it. I don't know. My, my grandson and Tom worked worked a while on this together, and it was, that was nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but they did social distancing, definitely. So did you want to add anything, Betty? Well, you know, um, I, I, I grew up in New Jersey, and of course we were in, in, integrated, but I, I don't remember really being that integrated. Like the town I lived in, we were all white. It was a small town. Yeah. And I went to a, a big school, and of course, you know, we were all mixed there. But one thing I, I remember suddenly showing up when I was in high school, of course, we had both colors on all of our teams, but suddenly there was elections and two very popular black students wound up on the student council, uh, co-captains in the football team, and then in other places. So I think someone within our school system was was seeing uh, some neglect going on there and and putting us together and and pretty soon some of the boys would bring their girls to some of our parties and uh, yeah so you have to know it was a shock to me when I married my husband who was from the south who grew up in Arkansas. Huh. He spent the first year of his life trying to keep me out of the wrong bathroom. <laughs> Truly, he was always grabbing me. Because the first place we came to was Norfolk, Virginia. And, uh, and, but later on, over the years, when we lived in Panama, we had some and some neighbors who became very, very, very close friends with us. And they were both, I guess what they call now African American, but they were from New England. And their ancestry, I recall now, had nothing to do with slavery. They were from mm -hmm. the islands. And one of them, one of them, I can't remember what was this, the wife or the husband. The father was a doctor. And it was, <laughs> they, they had a black dog. And the black <laughs> dog didn't like hardly anybody. But we would all go off someplace. And my daughter was just a toddler then. And that dog protected her. We could let her run around. And he would only let her go so far and he would let no one get near her. Mm -hmm. And it, in years later, when I began to observe some other things, I think this was present in Obama, why he was so successful, why he could put himself out so much. He had no ancestry of slavery. Yeah. yeah. No history to overcome. Well, when the first time I said that to somebody, they said, what are you talking about? 
Yeah. So, yeah, think about it. He had no, he, that was not part of his ancestry. Guess what? So when you, Kamala you, you can Harris think. doesn't either. Oh, really? Yeah. No, Haitian and Indian. Well, the the there was a lot of slavery in Jamaica, but I I, I think you're probably right, Jane, that she doesn't have the the uh, heritage of slavery. <clears throat> so yeah. that that's a very interesting thing to keep in mind. Both yeah. the first black male president and the first black female vice president yeah. did not were not descendants of um, slaves here. So if we can just get they were descendants of feeling them. like victims. Then I think that would serve yeah. a big purpose, you know, big. Yeah. Well, I would I think, think, well, I don't know if any of y'all read the Washington Post about the women in Mexico, how horrible they're having such a horrible time over there being oh. killed and being raped. And even if, when they're young children around seven, they, they've taken over a building in Mexico just for women. No man can go into it because they're not paying attention to how many women are being killed every year in Mexico. Yes. Uh, it's awful. But I think uh, that's one thing. Uh, it's not only slavery, but it's the way we've been looking at women. And we've been looking, uh, you know, uh, people don't realize that every in person has something to add to the table. And uh, they've never looked at women like that. Yeah, the Hispanic culture is really bad about degrading women. Right. I, I, mean, I, uh, I grew up, I mean, I was working in San Antonio, high Mexican population, a lot of them from Mexico, and just trying to deal with some of the Hispanic men there. They don't want to deal with the women. You know, no. we weren't married, and they would turn to him for, you know, stuff that had to do with me. They would turn to him to talk with him. We're, we're, it's so many people who are degraded, and we have done this all out, accepted it. Well, I mean, women aren't accepting it anymore either. I mean, it's okay. it's like everybody has uh, been degraded for some reason, you know. And I don't know who started that, you know. <laughs> How about all the Native Americans and all the trans Black women that have been murdered recently? Yes, I, that's true too. I mean. Uh, we've got so much work to do in this country and, and all over the world, really, of, of looking at people differently, looking at people with everybody has good ideas, you know, everybody is an individual, uh, accept people the way they are, love them, you know. And it has to start with each one of us. And that's what Brian Stevenson said, we all have a brokenness somewhere. Mm -hmm. We all have, have had that somewhere in our lives. But I think Nita wanted to say something. Right, where is Nita? <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> I, I was just gonna say that I feel like, I'm almost 75 years old, and I feel like that I've been aware of deep prejudice about all my life. Yeah. Uh, I have, I grew up in Oklahoma, and I have Native American cousins. I have Hispanic part Hispanic first cousins as well and I saw things early on how both sides of those cousins were not treated quite the same as I was I also saw because our family was not well off we were probably the least well off family in our little town and I saw the economic differences too, how people that had got treated differently than people that didn't have. And I remember when I was four, a Thanksgiving where when I decided that women were for sure not treated like the men were. All my aunties and my grandmother and my mother worked all day preparing this huge meal. And then suddenly they said, Oh, go get the men in to come in and, and eat first. Well, that in our <laughs> family, that was a cultural thing. They fed the men first. And I said to my grandmother, I said, well, aren't you going to sit down? Oh, no, honey, we'll eat last. We'll, and I thought, well, that isn't fair. So <laughs> I saw a lot of things that were not 
fair. And so I just felt feel like that I had I've learned more as long as I've lived, but I feel like that I got a very good education and things are not fair from early, early on and that people got looked at differently if they had, <laughs> if they had money and they didn't, if they were boys, girls, versus <clears throat> boys, Hispanic kids versus white kids and Indian kids versus white kids. I, I feel like that that was a, a great blessing for me. Well, and the kids know early on, I worked in a museum in, in Fullerton, California, where we taught a class with whatever the exhibit was at the time, and half the class would watch the exhibit, and the other half would come and do a craft project with me. And then I'd get thank you notes from all of them, and they were all Hispanic. Many of them spoke no English, so it was their next door neighbor in their seat helping them do the job. And I would get thank you notes saying, oh, thank you, Miss Lynn. You're so beautiful with your blonde hair and blue eyes. I wish I had that. So at, at second grade, they're already hating themselves because they don't have blonde hair and blue eyes. Yep. Yep. Okay. So Jen, there's also um, prejudice in, um, each, each category. The blacks have different prejudice if they have different color skins. And what I've learned um, one of my friends is a lesbian and I had no idea what was all entailed in that and there's different kinds of lesbians in it and they're all it, it, it's just amazing and, and you see it with the Spanish it's it's within their own ethnicity it's it's there's prejudice mm -hmm. you know so it, yeah. it's, it's everywhere Janet, what were you going to say? I was going to say that I'm, uh, for myself, I'm uh, working, uh, doing inner work on this issue in a way that hasn't been mentioned yet, which is that what's the root of this business of not just welcoming everyone? Um, because two-year-olds don't care. They don't see anything. I mean, it's just, they sense, they know, and they run and hug and play and let's get busy in the sandbox together. Um, so for me, um, I have, here I am at this age, trained the way I was trained, and I had tons of not good enough in my, in my psyche. So, uh, um, so what keeps me from just being friendly and open to everyone? Why do I need this self-protection business? Um, so, um, you know, doing the work that sometimes are at these, talked about at these meetings about our personal power um, and our knowing our own goodness and living it, living it, living it. Another thing that flashed in my mind, uh, so probably many of you have heard of Jerry John Polsky. He's no longer with us on this earth plane. Um, he, he's written, written many books, Course in Miracles of Based, which is very parallel. And he has this, this story, it's just so vivid in my mind that was coming to mind, is the, the woman from his, in his close group, had the classic, a male got into her car. I actually don't know the color of the male, but he was threatening her and he had some kind of weapon and there she was. And she did, she filled herself with light. She just beamed as much love and attention for him to really see who he was in that moment and in whatever moments followed and it worked for her um and uh but what does it take to do be able to do that um all the the lessons we've heard i don't know different people all have such a rich background and all these things that you've read and enriched yourself with um but this image of am i tighter can i open into what is more unknown or what's wanting. I have an impulse to yank 
Um, and what, what does it take in me to say, um, I'm going to come from love? Where will that, you know, what happens then? And I've, I'm, I, I play it out and there's things in my life and I test it out. And um, it's amazing how well it works. It's amazing. It's amazing. Um, so I know it may sound like this is a different topic, but for me, it's the root, it's the same topic. Um, and uh, it isn't in my nature. I don't feel drawn to go sit around with people and talk about something, some group. Um, to do this, to find out how do I fix this in myself, and then maybe I'll have a clue that will be of influence. My vibration is, an, is of influence. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. So, Janet, by opening that into the group, you help me. Mm -hmm. And thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so, Bob, do you have something else to say? I know we have two Bobs here, but I'm talking to Bob Brannigan and then. I've already spoken, but I don't think Bob has um, other Bob. Oh, I've, I'll put in my two cents. Um, I'm just going back to my high school. It was a small class, but I was the, probably the most liberal male in my class. And as I grew up and had my own daughters, I realized that their values would make my views be, I, I would be a racist. Um, and I think that the truth of the matter is the vibrations of the humanity is increasing at, in every generation. And I'm learning from my daughters. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, it's, I, I, there's some people that have decided what is black and white and they won't change, but Others do look and, and realize, and the awareness of racism today is higher than it has been, I think, in the past. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and um, I think we're all growing. And as we increase our vibrations, we have to let go of our biases. So that's my two cents. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Janet, that really was valuable for me too. So I know that um, mm -hmm. it's important to remember our power, our inner power. Thank you. Thank you, Bobs. Those. And I see Violet hasn't spoken. And I don't know if Sylvia would like to say something also. How are you, Violet? Good. So um, I've been thinking about uh, what Paul said when he talked about the, the, the protections that we put up. Um, I don't know if that's yeah. stating it the way he meant for it, but um, that was how I heard it. And I know that I put up a lot of protections. Yes, you do. And <laughs> who said that? <laughs> who said that? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, and I became aware, I got some feedback recently from somebody and it, she said that um, it's sort of like you go, when, when you come up in a new, like a new situation, a new person, whatever, you say no, no, no. And then, uh, you know, as you get used to the situation, it's then it changes to yes. If, if it meets my criteria, then it's yes. And then I go yes in a big way, but it's, um, you know, I've been thinking about this and, and in light of what we talked about today, uh, what would happen if I could let down some of those barriers that I put up? And I've never thought of myself as being um, as being prejudiced. I'm sure I know that I am in some ways, but um, I always felt that I was inclusive. You know that I um, I wasn't 
I'm not very judgmental. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in, in, I'm very judgmental, <laughs> I know. Um, I, I guess toward, toward people of color, I always felt that I, I was not, you know, that I was um, open. But I, I see the little, the little ways that I react to people and um, I know that there is prejudice there. There definitely is. And um, so it's interesting, um, little, a little incident that happened yesterday. Mm. I saw this, um, I was on my walk. I was on my um, way back home from my walk. And I saw this rabbit, a white rabbit out in someone's yard. Oh. And I thought, oh, don't, I wonder if they know that it's out. You know, it looked like it would be a pet. And uh, so I mentioned this, my neighbors were out as, as I uh, walked by and I mentioned this and uh, uh, one of them said, well, why don't you go knock on the door? And I said, well, I'm shy. <laughs> I don't like to just, just walk up and somebody I don't know from Adam, you know, and just knock on the door. And I don't know. I mean, I in depending on the house, I guess some some houses are more welcoming than others. <laughs> this one just didn't feel particularly welcoming. And so uh, she said, "Well, I'll I'll go with you." So we went over, and she knocked on the door, and she had the conversation. Aww. And the, the woman who lived there was Hispanic and she had a, a small child and um, uh, she didn't speak English very well. Well, you know, not too well. And, uh, but, you know, the two of them communicated pretty well. And anyway, the, the, the upshot, I guess, I guess I'm just thinking about, well, okay. How much am I missing? The, the woman was very, um, she seemed very happy to, for us to be there. And she said she didn't have money to buy lettuce for the rabbit. The rabbit oh, so it's, she was, was letting little, eat the grass. The grazing. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. Oh, the rabbit, cool. I guess, was belonged to the little girl or she had it for the little girl. And she said, uh, and my friend said, my neighbor said, I've always wanted a rabbit. And she said, please take it. She really wanted her to take it. And she said, no, uh, no, I can't, I'm, I'm allergic and so forth. But um, anyway, she, I, I thought, how much am I missing by being afraid to go up and knock on somebody's door, you know? Yep. And you know, I, I feel like, and this woman is, you know, obviously, it, she said just her and this little girl lived there. I'm sure she's having a difficult time meeting expenses and so forth. And, um, you know, this would, this kind of thing would be an, an opportunity to reach out and to meet people like this and to, to make a difference. In your life, some lettuce, yeah, yeah. Some lettuce yeah. and some carrots. Well, my neighbors were discussing this, and yeah, she did take a, she took over some lettuce right away. And um, I think it's good to notice, Violet, that yeah. you did it. Yeah. That counted. Yeah. It's yeah. not all. Now. It's not all. It's not all about something bad about you. You did it, and you enjoyed it, and you had some fun. So you you're already. Fun. You're launched. Well, I kind of stepped back and she took, she took. It doesn't charge. matter. It doesn't matter. You've had an experience. You're launched. <laughs> let's, no, let's notice what we do do. And let's notice how we're taking the steps already. And that noticing, gee, this small stuff wasn't too bad. I can do this. Yeah. 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 Good, Janet. Yeah. I've been, um, I, want, I want to share some of my experience. Um, I've been blessed in my life to have <clears throat> experienced the gamut, quite frankly. Um, I was born in Kansas <clears throat> of uh, parents who um, grew up wheat farmers. 
but my mother divorced uh, very when I was six. And uh, she married um, a guy from Mississippi. <laughs> um, and we ended up moving there. Um, first to Houston, <clears throat> then to Mississippi by the time I was uh, nine and lived in Mississippi. I lived in um, Atlanta and um, I lived in uh, Memphis, all of that until I went to college and I headed back to the Midwest to go to college. But I experienced, you know, my mother didn't have inherent um, uh, deep uh, um, prejudice like my stepfather and all of his family and everybody around me the whole time I was growing up there did. Um, I do remember being kind of surprised in, um, in school when we went to rallies, um, pep rallies, that the first thing that they did was to stand up uh, when they played Dixie <laughs> at the opening of every pep rally. <clears throat> and um, in Holly Springs, Mississippi, the um, the county there was 75% black. And uh, I lived there and it was only 30 miles from Oxford. And I lived there when James Meredith entered Ole Miss and I was just, I was a kid. And I remember that everybody stayed up all night long. It was on the radio all night long that night that they actually burned a bunch of the buildings and wow. it all Miss. <clears throat> and everybody stayed up all night long because all the white people did because listening to the radio because they were scared. <laughs> They were terrified because the county was three quarters black and they were afraid the whole, you know, all the black people were going to rise up against them and maybe come into their homes and murder them, you know. My uh, school was uh, certainly never um, integrated. <clears throat> and then I started college, moved away from there. I couldn't get away from the South fast enough. And I prided myself on the fact that I was not prejudiced like they were. <laughs> and what I want to say is, you know, that we've always, we, we always got places to learn and things that we can, you know, catch ourselves. And we should always watch ourselves about our judgments, no matter what. In college, I, I dated a black guy for a while. And um, after I was divorced in my 30s, I uh, actually had a, a black uh, female roommate for six years. <clears throat> but I had the opportunity to learn a whole lot from her. And, and there were things that I would realize. I really appreciated the culture. When she would get together, when her family would come over and stuff, you know, I just I loved the way they all acted with each other. Uh, I'm a bit of a drama queen, and they tended to to be very uh, expressive, <laughs> and uh, and I loved that. I loved that about them and about their culture and about her, and um, and but there were other things that I noticed, uh, and and it wasn't until some years later, actually, after after I had uh, moved out to Virginia and w wasn't living with her anymore, that I realized that she <clears throat> she was, you know, she had her own experiences, and um, and it, she had quite a few wh white friends actually, and she was the daughter of a very famous uh, um, jazz pianist, and uh, so. She had some, you know, it, we were talking about that, um, that they have different levels of, of uh, culture within their own race. And uh, so, <clears throat> yeah, clout. yeah, and so she, she wasn't as 
angry at white people as a lot of folks are, you know? And, and I also noticed, I would notice things every once in a while, the things would get, you know, just pointed out to me <clears throat> about my own prejudices. Uh, uh, once when we were, uh, we were riding along, I was driving and there's this black guy who's kind of crossing the street and he was just sauntering along and we had to actually stop for him. <laughs> and she leaned out the car and yelled at him <laughs> and said, get out of the pop, pop, pop road. You know? <laughs> well, she could do that. I couldn't do that. But I noticed that I would have liked to have. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, so there are cases like, so I asked myself, so what was that? You know, and I try to learn about uh, well, what would motivate him to be that way. And it occurs to me that the, the black community as a whole is so unempowered <clears throat> that just doing something like that is the only way that some people can maybe yeah. express their own personal dignity you know is to be able to have the power to hold somebody up in the street <laughs> you know while That's they fine. walk across it thank you very much so anyway my whole life i've tried to it's it's been a good it's been a good thing for me to always check my own judgments no matter what and i'm always learning and and I'm what I'm noticing now in the uh, in the Black Lives Matter thing and and <clears throat> and what's going on with all of this uh, and uh, is that I'm having to watch my own judgments about about the the um, the protests being too angry. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to ask my, who am I to judge? I haven't lived that life my whole life. I may have dated somebody in college and I may have lived with this, you know, this wonderful black woman for six years and blah, 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 blah. But I still don't know. And the only way that I, you know, that I can is to, uh, faith, as you've talked about with having that, uh, you know, what Brian Stevenson said at some level, we're all broken. Well, having grown up in the South as a woman back in the 50s and 60s, you know, um, that, uh, and when we'd go to uh, the dinners at, uh, at my stepfather's aunts and the whole family gather, all the and they were all very, 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 very country folks. Why all the women would cook, the men would sit around and talk, you know, and, uh, and uh, the women would serve the men at the table. And uh, when the men got done eating, then the women got to go and eat at the table. So I, I knew a lot about that. So I have some compassion <laughs> as far as, you know, Carolyn, you know, as far as as uh, far as understanding, you know, how, and I was part of the women's movement very early on. So, so I can have compassion, I guess, from that standpoint. But my long, my, the real point I want to make is, is that we can always check ourselves with our judgments about anybody. Mary Morrissey talks about the time that she went into a grocery store and the, in the, and the checker was so rude to her and she was just so angry about how rude that checker was to her and she wanted to complain to the to the store manager and the young boy who helped her out with the uh, with her grocery she complained to him and he says oh i'm so sorry he said <clears throat> her daughter just got hit by a car this morning and she's in the hospital but the woman has to has to work she has so little money she has to work and so please forgive her she's having a really hard day so at any moment you know in any circumstance we can invite ourselves to check our judgments so yeah thank you thank you for doing that we have to watch our time now anybody else any other comments here no okay uh, just a, a few news things on uh, next sunday we are going to be voting on the bylaws and also uh, the offices. So the president, secretary, treasurer, 
and we would like to vote on the VP, we have an opportunity for a VP, very important person. <laughs> so think about that, but we're going to be doing that. And if you have any questions, Carolyn, you had a question about it. Um, if you, laws, yes. Yeah, if you can call Paul, he can help you on it because he has it right on the screen. He could change the wording and everything like that. If you, if you well, it's the uh, I don't know whether uh, Faith might know. <laughs> it was about leadership council meetings. It was about how who who uh, the salaries of people. Uh, that was one thing I didn't like about Unity is they weren't uh, disclosing what the preachers made or anything like that. And uh, that and they they and they have this in here too. Uh, that uh, that their salary and uh, are not discussed. When so I take that to mean you wouldn't discuss that in an open meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Like our council meetings are always open to congregants. If we're going to discuss salary issues for employees, we close the meeting. It doesn't mean that people can't know what they want, what people are making now. Yeah. Uh, I think that transparency in that is important mm -hmm. because people need to know where their money's going. Exactly. That's what I was thinking. That's why I, when they said this, uh, I guess it would be in uh, the budget. When they yeah. hand out the budget, right. they should have it in there. Yes. <laughs> yes. Would have where all the money was going. The treasurer report would have exactly how much we don't have a minister, but how much they would be making. Mm -hmm. But they did have uh, in the bylaws they had a section that said, you know, it's open to everybody except for what was it called, personal matters or something. Personal or, issues. Yeah. Personal, no, personal issues. Person, not personal, personnel. Personnel. Personnel issues, yes. Yeah, and, and the salaries and stuff. But you would know what the salaries were because they would come in the... the <coughs> right. You would know that. Okay, that's, that was what I was, I just didn't understand that exactly. So that's fine. That's so fine. if you want to have input a bit about what's going to be in the salary, Become vice president. <laughs> well, she's going to be the secretary. She's going to be secretary. Well, I think any, anyone could have input in, yeah. in that, but the decision making itself might go into the members of the leadership council. Does yeah. that make sense? And it, it's um, really the, the, th the, the kind of the point of it is that um, personnel things are kind of a are kind of inherently a private thing, and um, right, uh, right. I, I understand it's that. it's more of a it's not so much that it's private, but that it's discretionary. Yeah, you know, there's a need to be discreet uh, about yourself. it. And uh, I'll I'll mute her, Betty. I'm going to mute you. Sorry. Um, I thought that was Jane. No, it wasn't Jane. Oh. Okay. <laughs> It brings uh, so um, okay, I, I understand which, that. I understand. Yeah, it's it's yeah. just the the <laughs> personnel things that need to be discreet. Believe, um, I assure you that uh, uh, those of us that participated in the uh, drafting the bylaws are painfully uh, <laughs> sensitive to the openness, the need for openness and transparency. Yeah. Right. Yeah, uh, that's just I've, you know, uh, concerning this other organization. That's uh, every organization that Ann and I have participated in has been very open, and for us, it's very foreign for the um, board meetings to be closed. And I, you know, I personally feel that that is a a big red flag for. Uh, <clears throat> for board meetings to be, you know, for board Always meetings closed. and or, you know, anything like that to be closed. It needs to be open and and transparent. You know, the the personnel stuff we need the personnel stuff is is you have to be discreet about that. Yeah. Right. 
that's that's the only thing. If you get a chance to look at it, just um, actually Paul is the best one to call if you have any questions, because he has it all on the computer there. Yep. That would be good. Okay, so any other questions? Anything? Yeah. I want to thank everybody for their donations, for the PayPal, for sending me checks to my house. Um, it really is appreciated. And we know we, we give out of our abundance. And I know we set spiritual law in motion. So thank you for doing that. Um, yeah, I just want to go a little bit faster because we want to get to the... Um, Oh, okay. All right. So here's our here's our um, offering prayer. What I know is God is the source of all supply and money is God in action. And as we give, we set spiritual law in motion right here. We are clear. We give out of our fullness. We give out of our abundance. We give out of our overflowing blessings. <laughs> give to our Center for Spiritual Living teaching chapter uh, and we know we touch the minds and hearts of all that come and our group expands in number and consciousness and we and we, our lives keep getting better and better. We live from a state of gratitude. And I just wanted to, to um, plug in here. Uh, Reverend Faith was talking about good and my favorite good quote, um, Ernest Holmes is good and more good. Um, are mine and everlasting good is mine. It goes before me, makes my way clear and it presses itself against me. I love that. So <laughs> that's, that's great. I say that all the time. Um, we'll do the blessed always, Jane. Okay. And I'm gonna take a quick second to say one of my favorite quotes which Reverend Faith you reminded me of today is from Rumi who says sell your cleverness and purchase awe <laughs> sell your cleverness and what? purchase, purchase awe, awe. Oh, that's, mm -hmm. nice. that's nice okay here we go everybody uh, should all mute <clears throat> Blessed always, always. Blessed always for the arms of God surround us. Let our joy be so triumphant that we rest in God and say amen. Blessed always, blessed always, for the arms of God surround us. Let our joy be so triumphant that we rest in God and say amen. That we rest in God and say Amen. Faith, would you like to pray us out? Thank you very much for being with us today, Faith. Yes. Thank you. It was so nice to be here. And, and so I just claim that this day has been blessed by this time together and that we carry these blessings with us through the week. Whatever is ours to take with us, to grow, to learn, to share, we take that and spread it out into the world and we leave anything that is not for us behind. We don't pick up what is not ours. And I just give thanks for each and every person who showed up and shared their wisdom with us today. And so it is. Thank you, and so it is. So it is. Thank you, Reverend Faith. Yes, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. And we'll all come from love, Janet. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yes, yes. Very okay. nice. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all. I, I see you. your message, Bob. You awful guy. 
Oh, I feel awful. <laughs> I feel awful. <laughs> oh, oh. oh no, another horrible punster. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for joining. Enjoy your week, and we will see you next week. Look for my email. Yes. So glad I could finally be back with you again. Yeah, no. really nice. Well, oh, thank you, Betty. No, yeah. okay. Bob. I used to work with a fellow. Uh, we shared an office, and uh, he was also a horrible punster. We'd have somebody come in and, you know, sit down to, you know, wait for us to come up for air so they could have some kind of, ask a question or have a discussion or whatever. And the two of us would look up and start bouncing puns back and forth between us. After a minute or two, they'd get up and walk off without saying a word. <laughs> and then we'd get back to work again. Paul, you want to stop the recording? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Good. Well, everybody have a wonderful week. You too, Beth.